of our sector specific trainings, which take several months. Um, and really, really many of them require some English language competency. You want to think about the, the middle ground um, of, you know, trainings that are shorter in duration, but might have contextualized ESL, for example. Um, so we're talking uh, to potential partners both around those models and fundraising as well. Um, uh, uh, Portia and Emma mentioned our construction site safety training program, which we're very excited about. Um, that work is very relevant to our New Yorker population as it has been uh, to recent immigrants past. Um, and we've applied for a potential funding source, which we're very excited about, that could raise the capacity of that program by you know, 50%. So fingers crossed if anybody has their rapid speed with them, um, we're um, you know, hoping that funding will come through. But if not, we're also pursuing other opportunities. Um, and our wonderful community partners, I cannot say enough good things, um, we've been having, I would say there are, um, there are top collaborator, our, you know, top conversation partner, our, our top brainstormer. Um, and, um, we've been talking to, uh, to, to, uh, our colleagues at CUNY about a number of different areas. Um, one is partnerships, potential partnerships around ESL and contextualized ESL, um, and also to stand up some occupational trainings for New Yorkers that include assessments and that around bridge services. Um, and we've had conversations with our, our LaGuardia and our Lehman colleagues about those. So um, I didn't realize that I would be talking for so long. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, I um, don't know how to say it more eloquently than that, um, but we're really, really excited uh, to be working with our Deputy Mayor's Office colleagues, um, with our CUNY colleagues, um, our colleagues at other city agencies, and also with our DYCD, HRA, and DIFTA colleagues as well. Um, we've been talking about, it, it could be a whole other slide back uh, for another day, um, but a real focus of our work this fall has been not only um, working in the SBS space and coordinating with our non-workforce development colleagues, um, but also working more closely with our uh, fellow workforce development agencies such as HRA, such as um, DYCD, such as um, DIPTA, to um, really think about as we look at the universe of, of you know, clients, um, and uh, NYC Talent helps us a lot with this work and is the linchpin of it. As we look at the universe of workforce development clients, which includes New Yorkers, who can serve them the best and how can we support each other in that work? So very excited about it. Um, look forward to telling you about um, this work more to come in the months ahead. Um, and uh, we appreciate your leadership and your partnership. Very excited. I mean, I would say just anecdotally that the top industries where we're seeing opportunities don't differ too much from the top industries where we're seeing opportunities for all of our workforce one clients. But you know, just to just to take some of them off the list, um, accommodation and food services is always very popular. Um, professional scientific and tech services, construction, um, uh, retail. Uh, so you know that's uh, just a, just the just um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, we placed some New Yorkers in um, security guard jobs, um, custodial work, um, park, parking lot attendant work. Um, so it varies, and we're also um, looking at more skilled uh, roles and more mid-level roles too. Um, so. In terms of the pipeline growing, um, you know, Emma made a very good point. Uh, you know, we're starting out, and it's kind of like a, a like inverted pyramid, um, where you know, starting out with a base of over a thousand, but it's going to continue to grow. Um, so one of the things that my team is really thinking about, um, and we're you know, standing up a team internally um, that we're going to grow even stronger um, within the workforce development division of SPS, is. Um, for business development, we can leave no stone unturned. 
Um, so um, not only reaching out to um, existing employers, but those that reach out to us. Um, we've been connected through City Hall to a number of staffing agencies that we've had calls with, I think, no less than three in the past week, maybe four or five. Um, you know, our own personal networks, networks that leadership has. Um, so we really want to make sure um, that we're connecting New Yorkers to, you know, good jobs. Uh, so we're going to continue um, doing that work as time goes on. heard that um, not a lot of people were going for the temporary um, work permit or whatever they call it. What percentage of people are eligible to go for it and have, what percentage have uh, accepted it have gone have applied? We, we can follow up on that specific number. Okay. You, sorry. Um, we can follow up on that number, but just to clarify, your the question is how many are eligible and how many of those who are eligible are applying yeah okay we let's let's follow up on that specific question we, we can follow, talk to follow also. We had is of course a path into the union uh i trust that these are we look we don't mind beginner or entry level but path forward are we using any incentives for the businesses that want to be involved not at this stage. Um, we welcome a conversation about uh, if, if you have ideas about that specifically, but not currently at this stage. Um, and just uh, to close the thought out on TPS, we, to, to Yuri's point, we're being extremely um, committed to reaching all of the folks who have, who are eligible for TPS, um, specifically Venezuelans, which are the, the recent um, population that were uh, recently made eligible. Um, through the shelter system and through Workforce One outreach. Um, and I think that this exciting model of coming on site physically to the shelter systems will also kind of help uh, support that outreach. One thing I want to know, um, even though it's not designed as a business incentive per se, our customized training um, opportunities offered through, through SBS where, where you know, businesses, especially small businesses, can receive grants um, to be able to to upscale their you know, workforce and increase wages, um, they serve as a, as as a really good incentive in you know, my view. Um, so to the extent that um, that you know some of our smaller businesses throughout the city are bringing are able to bring on workers, including you know New Yorkers for a time, um, start at a lower wage and then upscale them. Um, we have generous funding available through SPS in order to be able to do that upscaling to meet to even even you know better wages for them. So we can. I think we're looking. Um, I shouldn't say I think I know. Um, we're looking to broaden the you know pool of eligible businesses for that, and you know broaden the reach of those funds. So that could be a good outcome. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. What, uh, just to build, just to build on the Senator Sanders line of questioning, um, so the incentives aren't necessarily to hire new New Yorkers. Or the incentives with a business owner isn't necessarily to hire a new New Yorker. But once they're in, once the new New Yorker is hired, there's incentive to upskill them and develop their skills. <laughs> sure, I would, um, I would add the following to that. Yes, I would say that that. One of the primary incentives that Workforce One offers, that our Workforce Development System University offers to hire workers, is we'll do a lot of back-end work for you. Um, so we'll you know, pre-screen clients, we will post many job fairs, um, we will um, do everything but the final interview for you. Um, so, so to me, if if you know you're a small business owner, if you're really really busy, if you don't have a lot of experience in hiring. Um, very much, it's not an understatement to say that Workforce One could be your in-house shop for a lot of that, you know, work. So while we may not be offering cash incentives per se um, for you to hire um, for you to hire New Yorkers, um, we are offering services that do have a tremendous value, especially to a small business owner um, or any business owner for that matter who may not have the resources or the time. Um, and but um, but in but in terms of upskilling workers, what you stated is response. I understand. Thank you. My question, um, this issue is very important to me personally, as well as important to me, obviously. My parents are immigrants. Half my family were in this situation. I documented for quite some time. Um, and, and obviously, like all other New Yorkers, and children on the streets, all of us can do you know, what, what, what 
avenues that we want to do what we can. I, I'm interested, Vice President Gore um, shared with me his analysis that this is actually the first wave of uh, migrants from the climate crisis. And I don't know to the extent that that has been useful as a frame in attracting a different kind of philanthropic support. Um, so if that hasn't been the case, certainly I would want to be helpful in trying to figure out um, ultra high net worth individuals and foundations who um, may not have a, a pure workforce pieces to their funding would certainly want to be supportive of helping the first wave of you know migrants who are fleeing droughts and the economic conditions caused by those droughts um, and, and, and getting them set up. And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a reframing there. So, so, so that's part, part of the question. And then my real question, I guess, is this issue is so important and changes week to week. What is the role that you all see of the workforce for of us? What are we being asked to, to do? And what are the ways that people like me, who this is very high priority for, can be 100% supportive of the efforts of the, what, do you, what, what specifically do you guys need from us? Yes, we can give you a Rolodex of employers. Is that the main thing to go talk to other employers and bring you a list of people who want to hire? Or what, what's the, what, what can we do? Um, I would say two things. First, um, Thank you for your for your earlier comments. Um, I think you know green. There's a lot of opportunities. Just as a side note, in, in you know green jobs, it's um, you know Mayor Adams has certainly made that a priority across city agencies, um, and it's something as my team is doing strategic planning for calendar year 2024. Um, it's an area that we want to focus on more. Uh, so I you know thank you for that. Um, in terms of what this or what this board of very tremendous and, and exceptionally distinguished leaders, um, what we can use um, your support with. You know, I would start with you know, two areas. Um, one, one is the Rolodex, believe it or not, if anybody has one anymore, or, or your Outlook or your LinkedIn contacts. Um, so um, we can- It's a metaphor. Um, I am a very unashamed, I'm a shy person socially, but I'm unashamed with calling through the following um, with this board. Anybody who's willing to hire new workers and has good jobs available for them, we would love to be here. So we're doing a lot of that work already, but there are tens of thousands of businesses just in the five boroughs alone. Um, we can never have too many contacts and make too many connections. So any jobs we can source would be amazing. I would say, you know, secondly is, you know, funding opportunities. So um, my talk today was introduced as how we're serving New Yorkers within the framework of you know workforce innovation and opportunity act VOA funding, which is um, which is the main crux of this board, obviously. Um, but WIOA is a start; it's not the finish. Um, so we're always looking to, and of course we have some city tax levy funds. But um, in even if it weren't a challenging fiscal climate, we're always looking how we can innovate, how we can add, how we can enhance. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, which um, I think it's obvious for the state, but I'll say it nonetheless, um, is that many New Yorkers have higher levels of need in terms of wraparound and support services. And the level of service is just above or just below, depending on how you want to look at it, you know, um, uh, services that are pure workforce. So, you know, connections to food, connections to professional clothing, um, connections to mental health, talking about mental health in the workplace, talking about mental health in the home just into a new culture. Um, all of these things um, are supported in various degrees by different workforce partners, you know, whether it's HRA, whether it's DYCD, whether, whether it's SBS. Um, but um, I think there's always a need, even if we weren't in a migrant crisis, to, to expand those services more. Um, and to also think about our training models, how we could expand our training models and how we can um, expand training in a more rapid way. So, um, to the extent that there are some of the philanthropic opportunities that, that you spoke about, those, 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 you know, types of introductions, um, helping us think strategically um, about, you know, different resources, whether they're monetary or otherwise, that we can use to expand training um, and expand, um, you know, wraparound services. And um, those are two areas that I can think of, and my colleagues probably have two more as well. Yeah, I have two other thoughts. Um, I, I absolutely appreciate the climate um, connection to this, and, and it absolutely is part of our philanthropy strategy, as is, you know, I think when we take a step back, we've talked about this being impacted by, by climate, but also it's shown cracks in um, our housing shortage. So, you know, going after the ties between that 
going after, you know, immigration support and like legal services provider funding. Um, I think uh, the it has exposed cracks that um, can be covered, not just purely by migrant specific focused funding. Um, so absolutely welcome a conversation on on philanthropy. And then I think, you know, broadly this work, um, a lot of us have been just sort of heads down um, grinding um, to try to make sure that folks have shelter and have a place to sleep. And the, the work on the workforce side is really how are, how are we thinking about getting folks um, on a path to self-sufficiency? Um, and, you know, the, the federal government was um, has been helpful in the TPS designation, but we, we absolutely need more, um, both on making more folks eligible, um, more populations eligible, um, as well as just a national resettlement strategy. Um, New York is really shouldering a lot of this burden, um, but we don't see it as a burden because these are all folks who can work. Um, we have businesses who can hire them, who need folks to work, um, but New York City is paying for, um, for the crisis and it is impacting, I think as all of you know, um, other city services. Um, we're, we're, we're having three rounds of peg cuts that are, um, you know, uh, going to be very challenging for, across all of the agencies. So I think um, joining us in our federal advocacy is also a, a large ask, and I'm happy to follow up with anyone who's interested. Speaking of um, housing and you know federal advocacy, I just want to add one one last thought. Um, I, I I was I was um, I was on a panel earlier this week, and one of the questions that I was going to be asked that I guess didn't come up was, um, what can folks do to advocate for more workforce development? you know, just like across the board, whether it's BLO or other things. And I was going to say, you know, it's seeing workforce development as a basic human right. It's seeing a job as a basic human right, just like housing, just like food, just like clothing. Um, it's no, it, it's um, not by coincidence that Deputy Mayor Storr Springer's title is mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, Housing, and Workforce. Um, it's funny, you know, I, have, I have a housing background in addition to a workforce background. Many colleagues that I make, meet do as well, um, and though and they do go together, but often people, especially the lay public, don't think of them together, and they should. Um, you know, workforce, getting a good paying job, it should be viewed as a basic human right, and once more people do it as such, I think our advocacy efforts around funding will, will you know, come a lot easier and in the public well. I just had a quick nuance, sorry. Talked about the broad range of services across agencies and the need to expand that. Is there a need to integrate those services? Are families receiving wellness and mental health and workforce development and clothing from the same provider, or are families moving between different agencies to receive those services from different agencies? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, that's not a critique. I'm it's, it's helpful to, to explain the process. So um, those services are gonna be offered and are, are starting to be offered through our case management services for all migrants. Um, it has been kind of uh, initially been provided through referrals from the intake centers um, where folks come in, but there are a lot of touch points and depending on whether you're in a DSS shelter or a emergency <coughs> management shelter, um, we, are, we are doing a, a lot of work to connect those folks um, in those individual places. Um, and workforces is, is one of those pieces. But I think Yuri's point earlier was if you have providers or um, organizations who are interested in getting involved more, um, please please um, share them and we can plug them into that existing infrastructure. Thank you. Question, how do you think about the especially small businesses that are more than likely or interested in hiring, this demographic. How are you thinking about supporting them in terms of because having in my for my first company, we hired a lot of refugees. And so we also had a lot of employees that were living in shelters. And that created a ton of obstacles in terms of just getting them to show up for work because there's not a well thought out integration between what that looks like whether it's restrictions on when they can enter and leave the building, your work schedule, <laughs> oftentimes not working traditional hours. How are you navigating that to support the businesses? I, I think that's a really great point. Um, we're still um, you know, in the very early stages um, of you know, placing the New Yorkers in jobs. Um, we, the issue that you mentioned actually just came up. Like if you, it's almost like you had a vision into my emails, you know, two days ago, right? 
And the issue was, and I'm, and I'm like, you know, fully transparent, so I don't mind sharing this with you all. Um, the issue was, is uh, that, you know, there, 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 there was an employer that has some really great custodial jobs and all paid really great wages, um, but the issue was the curfew at the shelters, right? Um, so, you know, in, in my follow-up in the upcoming days, one of the things we're going to see is what can we do about those rules? Um, you know, could we, those rules, of course, are designed to make sure people are safe, um, but, um, but of course, um, you, in addition to being safe, we need people to be able to have gainful employment and to be able to make a livelihood. Um, so um, I'm sure there is a happy medium there. Um, so we're going to work um, as we're building relationships with the shelter directors. Um, we're going to work on that, you know, and also, um, you know, speak to those clients to see what they need. Um, you know, do they need Metro cards? You know, do they need some support with Uber or Lyft on occasion? Um, you know, things like that. Um, and we're also thinking about, um, you know, as we do a New New Yorker 2.0, you know, what additional supports do we need? Um, you know, some type of a guide or maybe some type of a training or we know business owners, especially small businesses owner, business owners are very busy. It's in the nature, they're not going to sit through a five hour training. Um, but is there a quick guide? Um, and I know that the State Department of Labor has developed similar things. So um, we can collaborate with that, you know, when you're employing New Yorkers, what are some things you need to know, say, about work authorization as well, about the services that SBS offers, about the services that our agencies offer, about that nice bill that State Food Well offers. Um, you know, so we've been thinking about standing something up like that, but you made an excellent point, um, and it speaks to the need of us to work with the shelter directors closely, that um, rules and regulations um, and things like that aren't an obstacle for folks there with jobs, and we want to make it easy rather than hard for small businesses to be able to employ a uh, new New Yorker. So thank you for that excellent point. Uh, we're just starting on that work, but um, it's a top of mind. We're gonna take Jocelyn's questions last and yeah. I wanted to take um, So one is that there are housing alternatives within pro within nonprofit programming that might be able to um, address that. If you were thinking about how to expand those alternatives that are outside of the public. Um, shelter, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and how can they do that? And if um, that kind of helps with like thinking about the philanthropic strategy. Like, I'd love to know what that strategy is, but I will say that having a clear, like, ask of philanthropy <clears throat> of what you need, and if it's something like um, funding housing or stipends, and I will say, and I've this a hundred times with that, where I'm seeing the most success is when there's subsidies for small businesses and pay in the beginning is a lot more effective in having them hire than to ask them to have people go to training, right? Like, so small businesses are really resistant to having their employees go to training. They need them there. So I think that the subsidies on the front end are more helpful. And then that's also going to be part of your philanthropic strategy to say, hey, we want to fund this portion of, you know, um, wages so that we can get them in for this longer time period. So I think that um, where I struggle is when there isn't a strategy and like a real partnership between the city and the land. So that's something that we have. Um, we, I'm sure other people on the Asylum Seeker team would say that other things need to be funded, but since we are in front of you, we will say that we will absolutely be coming to you with our workforce wish list. Um, but also, I don't know if you've been plugged in with the, the, the work that um, some of our colleagues are doing at City Hall on the philanthropy side. So, uh, Happy to yeah, happy but I would also say that, um, and just like out loud, Breaking Ground has an amazing um, facility on, on, on Broadway in the city where folks can come in and come out as they feel, but it's small, right? Like, so how do they expand that for the, well, because they lose a bed, they lose a bed, and no one's going to lose a bed to work, you know, a job. So it's something to think about. Thanks. Thank you. This is, so this has been a great conversation, clearly the um, New Yorker situation is changing as we speak every day, trying to get a handle on what's happening. We have incredible colleagues across the government here. Um, what I would suggest is um, we continue to have this conversation. So I think we, we're, we're very clear that the, the government cannot be the philanthropy can take business and it's going to take advocacy at both the state and the federal government. So we'll, we'll put our heads together and figure out how do we to engage you because again I don't think anybody knows the exact right way to do this on the scale that we are operating 
at right now under the very tight fiscal constraints we have. So really welcome this conversation, but like to see some answers in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. We just want to change the agenda a little bit so we'll make sure that we get the presentation um, that we missed the last time around. So now we're going to hear um, about the initiative uh, now part of that earlier this summer and plan to advance the career success of people with disabilities. We're excited to welcome three guests for this conversation. Christina Curry, Commissioner of Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Martha Jackson, Assistant Commissioner, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Martha's new title is the um, Executive Director for the Center for Workforce Accessibility and Inclusion, and she joined the New York City talent team from where uh, her last month. <laughs> Her bio in the board book is the correct <laughs> <laughs> And David Herman, Deputy Director, Mayor's Office for Economic uh, Opportunity. That's the right title. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kick things off here. Um, on this project along, alongside these uh, great partners. Um, what's I think we may have given a, a snippet of this in past meetings. Um, basically, this is a really unique partnership across three mayor's offices. So we've got the mayor's office for people with disabilities. We used to have Commissioner Curry here with us today. Um, our office, NYC Talent, uh, which Martha is now a part of. Um, and the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, NYC Opportunity for short. Um, and we've been working together to plan for quite some time. Uh, over the summer, Mayor Adams announced the plan, the plan to advance the career success of people with disabilities. Um, and basically it has two key components to it. On the one hand, we wanted to increase investments in direct program services for people with disabilities. And a lot of those investments are in partnership with our colleagues at the Department of Small Business Services, SBS, um, in the Workforce One Career Center. So we're making investments in the Workforce One Career Centers to try to bring in more expert staff that can help serve people with disabilities in the centers themselves, um, starting in Brooklyn. And the other part of the plan is more focused on systems change. So what Martha is heading up is the Center for Workplace Accessibility and Inclusion. And so that is not going to be a place where we are trying to deliver services. Per se. Rather, it's gonna be, how do we help eliminate the barriers that make it harder for people with disabilities to pursue jobs and careers? There are financial disincentives. There's, there's Medicaid income caps. There's all sorts of things that are disincentives. Um, and Martha's gonna talk more about work that, that she is launching with the center. And then and David's going to talk a little bit about uh, his work with MSC Opportunity as a part of this broader initiative. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Curry of the Mayor's Office of Disabilities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Good. All right, I'm going to try that again, please. <laughs> I can hear you. Thank you. So, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Better. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so just to let you all know, to clear the air, I came here before I joined MOPD as, a, as an advocate for the disabled. I'm personally disabled myself. So, my perspective is different, okay? And I'm gonna voice for myself now, so it's not awkward. Oh. All right. Okay, so coming from the perspective of an advocate, I came from the disability community 
and I came here um, as a person who works for as a catalyst for change, permanent systemic change. In other words, when you were not compliant, you came after me, and then you had to be. Um, in joining MOPD and having great discussions with Martha, it only took like a week or less than a few months to know that um, MOPD had been underfunded for years in this initiative. Basically, we had no money. The administration, our administration, this current administration, is committed to embracing the disability community and defying the myth and the stigma that my community still faces to this day. In other words, most people presume if you're disabled, you can't work, or if you can work, it's low level jobs, it's stuff that does not really apply or match to people who have the degrees, but because of the disability, people perceive us as different. Um, okay, so if you look at the slide there, two thirds of the community, people with disabilities are, do not work. This figure is chronic, and it has not really changed for the past 15 years. That, however, is opposite for our non-disabled peers. 60% are employed. 30% of New Yorkers with disabilities live in poverty, compared to 11.9% of non-disabled New Yorkers. So while we're talking about employment, we're talking about we need gainful employment so that we can afford to live in our own apartments so that we can afford to eat. We should not have to choose between one or the other. Or, next slide. <laughs> so what we're also talking about is for the city has invested very little in employment ser services for people with disabilities, prior administration, we're not talking about this one. Over a three year period, the mayor's office for people with disabilities raised more than $5 million from private foundations and additional state funding. I have to stop and acknowledge Martha Jackson for that. That was Martha's. In, and also additional state funding. Over a comparable three-year period, the city invested only about $1 million. This included five baseline staff members dedicated to employment services. Again, that's Martha's efforts. So we need to acknowledge that because this really would not be a discussion without her. The next slide. We'll just move on. With a successful um, model in place, we, this whole team and others, are building on MOPD's NYC at Work, and that's the first public-private workforce program for people with disabilities. That's huge and very important to know. Launched by the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, MOPD, five years ago, was to, they were working on helping New Yorkers with disabilities thrive in the workplace. I cannot be the only person who's working as a commissioner. Other people who are disabled can do the job when given the opportunity. Again, Martha, I'm just saying, I want everybody to know, okay? The program that Martha worked on assisted seven, <laughs> Assisted 700 New Yorkers with disabilities to jobs over three years. Now, MOPD, and as Chris said, we're partnering with SBF, NYC Talent, to embed NYC at Work into the Brooklyn Workforce One Center. And this will be to increase the number of people who are disabled entering into the workforce. So we have the 55A program. And that's to increase the number of people with disabilities, or as we say, PWDs, in city jobs, including the New York State Civil Service Program um, that allows qualified New Yorkers with disabilities 
to access city jobs without taking a city or the civil service exam. Just so that you know, years ago, I applied through the 55A program and they kind of just stared at me like, why? You know, they said I was actually, they said I didn't need to take the city service, service exam because I could use my voice. And that meant to them, well, you can't be deaf and use your voice. That's not correct. You cannot hear, but still use your voice. That's important to know. You have to do education as well. Working closely with DCAS, they who oversees 55A program, the 700 total slots, but less than half are filled currently, meaning we still have slots available to be filled by people with disabilities. NYC at Work connected 120 individuals to city jobs. The Scion program, this took me a minute to understand what it was coming in as a new person. But this is Systems Change and Innovation Opportunity Network. New York State Department of Labor funded the program to expand the participation of individuals with disabilities in uh, Workforce One Career Center system. In other words, the state was involved <laughs> again because of Martha's effort so that we will have a program that will also improve their employment outcomes via the sustainable, job-driven, inclusive model that involves business and workforce demand. Let me just say this again, why this is important, because it gives us the opportunity for disabled people to be in jobs that their non-disabled peers are also working in. We can be side by side. Don't ever think because we're disabled, we can't. And that is something that Martha had pushed with all the things she worked on. So she made my job easier when I came in as commissioner. The other thing about the Scion staff is that the working collaboration with SDF and the Workforce Center for, it is so much easier for me to sign than the voice, but I'm trying, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I stutter a little bit, just because I'm trying to remember how the word sounds. So as I was saying, it's they're going to be working with these other agencies or centers to support and expand partnership, collaboration, service coordination, and service delivery across multiple education, workforce, disability, and career pathway programs financial counseling. So we're going to be partnering with the Department of Consumer and Workforce Protection. We will have the opportunity to expand our empowered New York City financial counseling programs to New Yorkers with disabilities and their families at the Workforce One Centers. Just a little tangent on that. There are many people within the disability group who have not had the full training, just like their non-disabled peers understand how do you budget your money? What do you do with your money? Do I pay my rent because I just got my first very large check? Do I pay my rent or do I buy the new sneakers? So with this financial counseling, this will assist people to understand money better. And this has not happened in the classroom. And a lot of times it doesn't happen at home, just like your non-disabled peers. So a little background note. I just want to give you this. Out of the 18 career centers managed by SDS that annually connect 25,000 New Yorkers to jobs, over the past two years, Workforce One has served about 3,000 individuals with disabilities and connected roughly about 350 to jobs. Now, since I've mentioned her name so much, Martha, you're up next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Can you hear me? Thank you. <laughs> That's why we get along. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, I just I'm really happy to be here um, and, and meeting all of you and talking about this. But I, I just have to take a moment um, because eight and a half years ago, 
um, when I joined the mayor's office for people with disabilities, so did Chris Neal. Oh, he didn't join the mayor's office for people with disabilities, but he joined, um, he, he was uh, back in, in the workforce. And Chris and I, from our first meeting, really wanted to see what we could do to create an integrated, accessible, respectful, um, vibrant workforce program that was sustainable, that included the city's workforce uh, system. And we worked for eight and a half years um, to be able to do this, but under this administration, we were actually able to take the ideas that we had had for so long and move them forward. Um, and I am eternally grateful to Chris. Um, and he also allowed me to come over here um, with Abby and the team to be able to make these things happen. Um, so if I could just have you just join me in thanking Chris Neal. <laughs> Um, so the Center for Workplace Accessibility and Inclusion. Um, first of all, you know, everything that we learned at MOPD, the pilots, the learnings, um, and the capacity that we have, we know that we've been historically siloed from those um, other city agencies focused on workforce development. Um, the disability community is siloed, period. It's siloed by disability. It's siloed by funding. And because of that, people don't collaborate, and you can understand why. Um, but through NYC at Work, we were able to kind of break down that barrier. We were not interested in the funding. We wanted to be able to make sure that um, other uh, participants from our community-based partners had the opportunities for um, all the opportunities that, that we were um, uh, bringing together. And there's no cultural, uh, no rather no central organization working in the disability workforce space to unite the field, and that's what really has been missing. So the center, which is now located here at the Office of Talent and Workforce Development, will be a public-private partnership. It is designed to tackle structural challenges that have impeded New Yorkers with disabilities from entering the workforce for so long. So we would be the inter intermediary needed to unite the field and ensure we identify and we address challenges holding people with disabilities from finding careers, jobs, and internships. We've already started establishing an advisory council comprised of uh, employers, providers, funders, government partners, agencies, advocates, and members of the disability community. And most importantly, we must engage employers and workforce, workforce providers to help them make their workforce and their workplaces and their services more accessible. But we need the city to be the shining example of this, because we can't ask businesses to do what we're not doing ourselves. And that's a very important role um, uh, that, that um, we are taking on. Partnering with key stakeholders to identify the most pressing challenges, align our public and private funding as we did at the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and most importantly, advance a shared agenda for policy change. Historically, the data for people with disabilities has been just horrific. Um, and so we are gonna be centralizing data and tracking. We're gonna identify, promote, and scale the best practices that we know exist because in some cases we were part of creating those best practices, but we need the business community to be able to support us. And this is really interesting as well. I think you've heard it, um, how important CUNY is to all of the workforce programs. But infusing accessibility design into computer science courses across CUNY to ensure that the next generation of technologists understand why, but most importantly, how to design software and hardware products that are, I'm going to use finger quotes here, born accessible. You don't have to make something, go back and try to remake it. You make it right from the very beginning. And launching a talent investment fund, investing in promising practices for serving people with disabilities, and for making mainstream programs fully accessible. And then finally, partnering with NYC Opportunity to co-design new innovative workforce services serving individuals with disabilities. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, David Berman. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with all of you and with this superstar um, panelists um, of mine here. I've been working over many months um, with this team to develop the plan. And one of the things our office does, the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, is we're really focused on using research, data, and innovation to solve problems like poverty and to promote equity. And so 
when we had the opportunity to partner around this issue, I think we were really excited because we were also recognizing, um, has already been said, just how underinvested in um, this issue has been, the lack of research and evidence around what types of strategies are most effective for these communities um, really struck us. And so as the plan was being developed, um, our office decided to pursue a new initiative as well. And for those of you who might be familiar with the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, we've invested in um, co developing a lot of different workforce initiatives with city agencies over the years, programs like Jobs Plus, um, Advance and Earn with DYCD, many different agencies we've worked with to develop workforce programs. And so we felt there was a, a really exciting opportunity to do some new investment here. And parallel to that, I think our office has also been really focused on how can we do more co-development and co-design strategies with affected communities that we're partnering with and to use city government tax money, all of our collective um, funding that we, we have some of in our office to invest in promising programs and into evaluation. So we wanted to bring kind of those two strands together and say, let's develop, we, we need more evidence around what works for these communities. We need more investment in workforce programs. And so how can we do that and bring together the co-design piece that we would like to do? And so over the past couple of months, we've been working to develop this new initiative um, and we're working right now on a concept paper that we hope will come out in the next couple months to all of you. We'll need you to help us spread the word um, and to the different communities. And what we'd like to do is fund um, a set of workforce providers to engage in a co-design process with people with disabilities to create new models, to create new programs. And so the idea is we would select a design firm that will support all of these um, nonprofits or other types of providers that will develop programs and then fund a planning process over several months with each of the selected um, providers who will each work with their communities to develop new programs. Then we will fund that program that they develop. So, and over multiple years, and we'll use data and research to understand how they're working, how we can improve them, and which ones are working well and should be expanded. So we have set aside our own city funding to do this. Um, we're gonna start with the concept paper so that we can make sure this is something innovative that we're doing. Um, while we use co-design in a lot of ways in our program development, this is a really intense form of that, that we're trying to demonstrate other city agencies could use more broadly. So that's part of our goal in doing this is just to demonstrate that co-design is important and effective way of creating new programs rather than just saying, here's a top-down model we're gonna fund and you have to do these 10 things the way that we tell you. Instead, we're saying, we're gonna invest in you working with your community to tell us what program you think will work best, and then we'll partner on that. So um, we think with the funding that we have, we could probably support three, maybe four um, organizations who will do this work. As I mentioned, we'll also be funding a, a design partner who will work with those firms to support them through a design process that we think should last around nine months. Um, and then we will be funding the projects that come out of that. So. We're hiring a staff person right now who will be um, helping us launch this. And as I mentioned, we've been working collectively, all of us on this concept paper. Um, and so you can expect to hear more about it soon. We'll want everyone's feedback um, and we'll use that feedback to really finalize an RFP that we'll release soon after um, the concept paper. So that's kind of the gist of it. And it's one that we're really excited about. We expect different models. We expect some of the models might be more focused around job training, creating a whole new um, type of workforce preparation initiative. Some and could be transforming an existing big system or big program to make it more accessible. So that's another thing that um, folks could apply to do. They can also apply to work directly, more directly with employers around making their hiring practices and their existing workplace um, more accessible and more successful for people with disabilities who are, who are there. Um, so we're kind of open to different types of approaches and we hope to fund a bunch of different approaches um, so that we can really increase. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I know we don't have too much time, so I'll just um, stop there and I'm sure folks might have questions for, for all of you. Thank you. Um, uh, I just uh, thank you. The presentation was wonderful. Thank you for your time. Uh, um, Commissioner, you know, stated that the, the community.
computing is often fragmented. So David, when you talk about co-designing with next phase, which you have segments in mind that you're thinking about participating in the co-design versus not, how are you, how are you thinking about that? I've been using the word communities because I think <laughs> there really are so many. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have enough funding to be able to reach every need. Um, so we just will ensure when we make our selection that they're diverse in terms of the communities they serve, which could be geographic, it could be people with a particular you know, set of disabilities, it could be a program that serves anyone with any kind of disability. We're ag a bit agnostic going in. We're data driven, so we're, you know, of course, want to support the, the areas with the greatest need and where there are the most service gaps that currently exist. Um, but our goal is just to try to fund as many different types of approaches as possible. And, you know, for those who are interested in philanthropy, we would love additional funding to support this initiative. If you if you have access to philanthropic partners, we could add more um, grantees to this if we had more uh, private money who want to throw into the pot. So um, we would be very excited to be able to award, make more awards and serve more communities. Hi, I'm Ada. Um, to that point, I guess, where can you give us sort of like a lay of the land, like when you're talking about different communities and different disabilities? Yeah, what are we talking about? I might have to turn that to my comment. When we're talking about different communities, it could be sensory, as in hearing, vision. Um, you can go over to the neuro, the atypical uh, neuro section of the community, uh, which would include those from the autism spectrum, TBI. You also have physical disabilities. The physical disabilities itself breaks into different groups. Those who use chairs, those who use mobile um, assistive device like I do, um, those who are dependent on human guides to help them uh, because of their disability. You, when you talk about physical disability, you also it could be someone who's an amputee because they don't fit in the same needs category as someone in a wheelchair. We go the entire spectrum. That also includes those with the invisible disabilities, chronic illnesses, and so forth. So as you can see, it's a vast landscape. And believe it or not, we don't all mix together and we don't have the same needs as one or the other does. Then there are the groups that, like myself, who are considered multiple disabilities, multiple disabled. Um, so it's a challenge on who you're going to pick from or what you really need that will help or assist the majority of people. It's, it's really going to be interesting when you look at the various communities, and that's how we refer to ourselves as communities, not just one. Are there any, um, like, really, have there been any really effective programs like that you look at? Um, i like to answer that. <laughs> uh, so, NYC at work which was the program that um, came out of the mayor's office for people with disabilities uh, was really to address the joblessness situation. Um, I joined in 2015 to address that. Uh, I looked at a lot of different cities, a lot of different programs, um, but basically I will tell you the one thing that I learned is that whenever you're talking about employment with people with disabilities, you're never talking to employers. So when we started uh, NYC at work, the first thing I did was have focus groups with um, with employers and businesses and ask them, why is this so hard? How can we help you? What do you need? Um, and just briefly, I will tell you that no matter the sector, they all said the same things. Number one, we don't know where to get the talent. Number two, we don't have dedicated staff and resources like we do with our other initiatives. Number three, we don't understand disability. We're not educated. Um, reasonable accommodation, you know, we, we, we are afraid of that. We're afraid of liability. Uh, number four, human resources. We usually stop the process at the door because they really are afraid about what's going to happen if they hire someone. And mostly, oftentimes, people will say, before I'm going to hire somebody, what happens if I have to get rid of them? Um, and then the last thing is that when someone does get hired, usually there's no career growth. So you have that idea the poster person in your office who's had the same job for 14 years 
and has never been able to move up. And that's actually what NYC at Work was based on. The businesses don't know where to get the talent, but we do. You don't have dedicated staff and resources to do this. We'll get the money. We'll hire the people. We'll help you, which is where the five million or so dollars came in to be able to hire dedicated staff professionals with um, expertise across all disabilities in workforce development. Um, you know, they said uh, we don't understand disability. We we're not sure. We created a disability etiquette and awareness training program that it started, you know, with just a small group, but as our office expanded, it is now presented by people with lived experience. Those who um, are blind, those who have hearing loss, uh, a person you know, with a physical disability across all spectrums, because they talk about living and working as a person with a disability. And until you have a conversation with someone and you can break that, that barrier and that myth, you're not gonna be able to see beyond that. So that's oftentimes our first step. And we created a business development council oftentimes most of the people there were in HR. A lot of people were in the ERGs because they have a real interest in this. Um, and at one point we had uh, over 100 members pre-COVID and they actually helped us get to those 700 jobs because only 120 of those jobs that we got were from government. All the rest were from the private sector, nonprofit in the private sector. And then the last is, you know, a person gets a job and that's where they stay. I am so proud of the team at NYC at work because they have taken that on. Um, when someone has been in a job for at least a year, um, we start talking about what's your next step? Where do you need to go? And we've seen real career growth over the course of the past three to five years, even during COVID. Um, salaries have increased uh, You know, for a lot of people. People live on Social Security, SSI, can be less than $100, $800 a month. A lot of the folks that we have, their starting salary is around fifty-one, fifty-two thousand dollars, and and you know that's not enough to live in New York City, but it sure beats living on Social Security. And these are all the things that all of us are trying to really address and figure out. But we cannot do it without businesses, because without businesses, we're not in business. And so that's really the model that we created. And I'm very pleased to say that it's being replicated now in some other cities. It, it is still available, and I think we've helped over 600, 6,000 folks um, get, get connected to the training. We've done it, the team did it virtually all through COVID. Um, it's still available to do in person, but part of what we're gonna be working on here is actually creating those trainings for our business community. So they, ha they will have access to this. Um, we know that you don't know what you don't know, and if no one's telling you or sharing, you're never gonna be able to get to the next step. And the truth of the matter is, is that people with disabilities like ourselves are, are dedicated, resourceful, um, committed individuals that want to do well. They want to be part of a mission, a goal. It's not just about the paycheck. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that the disability community is one we can join at any time. And so keeping that in mind, because you might be looking at somebody um, who on the other hand might be looking at you. <laughs> and you need to think about that because the truth of the matter is, is that we're all getting older, we have to work longer, and disability is part of aging in many cases. So um, there's a lot for us to, to do collectively, and I'm open and willing to talk to anybody who has any ideas about how to move this needle forward. And if you're interested, and disability etiquette and awareness training or talk about how we've helped businesses, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will say once again in my for my previous work too, I hired um, a lot of employees with hearing loss. It was one of the things for me that I really appreciated as an employer was that we provided support for orientation for the employees. Um, Whenever there was, I needed to have a meeting that we needed to make sure that the communication was clear and there was an HR related meeting that there was support also provided. And I think those little nuances was really helpful to make sure that we were safe 
and supported in the environment. So that's really good to know. And we, we have a great partner who's in the room as well. Um, New York State Access VR, uh, our state vocation rehabilitation agency is an uh, amazing partner and will oftentimes provide that kind of support as well. We, we don't do this in a vacuum. We, we are always looking to be able um, to help businesses because when you know you know you hire talent, you wanna keep the talent, um, it helps your bottom line, but sometimes you need a little help to do that. There's also a lot of tax credits. There's um, on the job training dollars where accessible, there's so many opportunities um, to create a really inclusive and accessible workforce. So thank you for that. Thank you for that very informative presentation. Um, we are going to leave the report for uh, from DCYC for our next meeting. So we'll have a round of applause. And then I will take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. A second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
but I could jump to Caitlin, who's now in another team, and so she gave me some names. And so I'll be here next week, and then I'll see you next week. Definitely easier. Just to look at it.